Thank you very much. Um, Um, I'm especially honored to be invited for, for the keynote speech. Um, I first want to congratulate the Maastricht School of Management with its 60th birthday. It's really fantastic to be able to, to celebrate that. When I was walking around in the building, I saw how much um, international the, the school is by all these um, certificates and statues that you receive from your partner institutes across the world. That, that's very wonderful. It's a, it's a great achievement for the school. I also want to thank uh, the Dean for inviting me. Um, we have been having cooperative um, partnerships for over the years. Next year we're going to publish um, a special issue in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, which was the result of, of a, a conference two years ago. So we have some ongoing collaboration, which is always very pleasant uh, to work with, with WIM. Thank you very much for the invitation. Today I would like to speak to you about the interrelationship or the cross-relationship between human biology and economics. Human biology and economics um, have a lot of things in common. Um, they're both interested in the um, advancement of well-being for mankind. And recently, human biologists and economics, economists have been working together to see how they can advance their common understanding of well-being. And my presentation today starts uh, with that new approach, human biology approaches together with economics, and later on I will tell you how this is related to conflict-affected countries and why this is important for us. I want to start with a paper by James Heckman, the Chicago economist. In 2007 he had a very nice paper where he said that there are two branches in economics, namely health economics on the one hand and the economics of cognitive and non-cognitive skill formation that have found a lot of interesting findings who were not related to each other. The scholars of both disciplines were not talking to each other, but they were finding common things. Huh? The health economists were finding that investments in ch early childhood determine outcomes later in life, meaning that people who are, as an early child, are in good health, they will also uh, do better in school, will get more schooling, will attain better grades, and later on have higher incomes. And he finds also this, this literature that this is not a question anymore of nature versus nurture. It's not anymore the insights in human biology are not anymore that people are born with certain abilities and they also have certain nature or environment where they grow up in each other. And these things cannot be separate anymore. We have genes and they express themselves according to the environment in which they live. Two children in very different environments can have the same genes, but what grows out of that, which genes express themselves, depend very much on the environment in which the child grows up. So it's not anymore nature versus nurture, it's the two working together that determine which genes will express themselves and which capabilities actually the child will develop. So these new insights emphasize the importance of the environment in which the child lives. Then the second brand of the literature, the economics of cognitive and non-cognitive skill formation, they found that issues such as self-regulation, motivation, um, adventurousness, time preference, affect the evolution of health capital throughout choices made by parents and children. Meaning that persons who are educated, who can read, who are self-disciplined, they will, more ex for example, more easily follow advice of doctors and care for their health. Yeah? People with longer time horizons and lower rates of time preference invest more in themselves. And so this is kind of self-enforcing. Yeah? People who do well in school, they will also read more about how they can care for their own health and will be better able to care for themselves and for their offspring. And so what James Heckman did was bringing these two types of research together in what he called the Heckman's capability model. So he says that you know, this evidence of these two branches of the literature can be brought together in what he calls a capability formation model. The agents, uh, human beings, are assumed to possess a vector of capabilities at each age, including cognitive abilities and non-cognitive abilities, as well as health stocks. Health stocks include the propensity for mortality and morbidity, including infant mortality. And all capabilities are produced by investments, decisions, environment, and genes. These capabilities are used with different wage in different sections of 
of one's life, including the labor market and one's family life, one's social life. And the capabilities produced at one stage, for example, in early childhood, augment the capabilities at another stage. Uh, healthy children, people do well in school, it's augmented. Uh, so when you do well at a certain age, it will develop also your capabilities at an age uh, later on. And that effect he calls self-productivity, meaning that people, uh, it embodies the idea that capabilities are self-reinforcing and cross-fertilizing and that the effects of investment persist. When you invest a lot in yourself as a child, it will pay off later in life. And that's the whole idea. That's the whole idea of self-productivity in his capabilities model. Next to this, um, this self-productivity, we also have dynamic complementarity. Let me give an example of that. If, for example, a child is good in sports and it learns to persevere in sport by training hard, by doing a lot of effort, this learning effect of being being good at something when you work hard for it, can then translate to its school experiences. When he can't, or she can't solve a mathematical puzzle, he may try, try harder because he learned to try hard in the sports that he or she was doing. And so this is dynamic complementarity or cross-fertilization. People who do well in certain domains may do well later on because they learn to persevere, to train themselves in another domain. And so capabilities in one domain affect the performance in another. And so uh, what is this dynamic complementarity and um, self-producing, self-reinforcing elements tell us is that it pays off to invest very much early in childhood. When you're 16, 17, or 14, 15, you already have some life experiences and it may be too late to change a lot of things. Of course, advice and social counseling will help, but they will help much more in early childhood. Because exactly it is augmenting, it's self-reinforcing, it's self-reproducing. And so Heckman pleads a lot for these investments in early childhood exactly because of these self-reinforcing effects. And so one can see this as, as a chain, as a cycle of, uh, of, uh, of um, events where human capital well-being are formed over the life cycle. It storms with experience in utero. And there's a lot of new evidence in, 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 uh, in, in very... Um, in very highly regarded journals, that in utero experiences of children already determine uh, gene expression later in life. Uh, and then it goes on to investments early in life. When you acquire good health, you can invest more in cognitive and non-cognitive abilities and do better in school. People who do better in school will have higher schooling, will have higher income later on, and are able, more able to care for themselves, increase well-being as an adult. And it is this chain of human capital investments over the life cycle that pay off a lot when early investments occur um, in childhood. And you can also look at that in intergenerational level. Adults who have gone through this life cycle and who have attained a certain well-being as adults, they will also be able to take better care of their offspring by having good control of fertility and maternal reproductive health. So there's also this intergenerational link that Parents who do well over this life cycle will also be able to, to, to take care of their offspring better by controlling uh, fertility and, and maternal reproductive health. And so this, is this, this life cycle is, is very much uh, um, put forward in this uh, economics and human biology literature. And if you look at, at this, what economists do is, okay, how can we know that one thing that happened at one stage in life affects the next stage? And so typically what economists do is that we're going to study each step. We're going to take this apart, we're going to each step at a time. And so there are two grand literatures to study these steps. One is the, the shock literature. We're going to look at external variation. That happens not because a child or a parent does something, but because an external shock happens. For example, a period of involuntary employment or a sudden interruption of the school career. That's a, a sudden shock. And when that sudden shock happens, we can study its effect on the next stage. And that, that's, that's one way to study that. The other way is to organize a policy intervention. Huh? I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Esther Duflo at the MIT Poverty Lab. That's what she's doing. She's organizing policy interventions deliberately to see what the effect is on the next stage. Huh? And so these two ways of studying uh, the effect of investments during the life cycle in the next stage are what economists currently are doing. 
and I'm going to give some examples of, of both of these, of both of these uh, approaches. First of all is the panel data approach. So what you do is you collect data at the household level uh, in, a, in a country, then there is some kind of shock occurring, and then you go to revisit the same households again to see how this shock uh, affected the households that you are studying. And I'm taking some, some three uh, a lot cited papers from, from the literature to show what this approach can do. So they've been following households over five or over ten years to see how shocks early in childhood affect outcomes later in life. So Alderman in 2001 finds that child health, as measured by height for age, within, when children were five years old, has a strong positive effect on the probability of being enrolled in school at age seven, especially for girls. So the health of children at young age positively affects their enrollment at later age. A study in the Philippines by 2,000 households by Gluey, Jacobi, and King find that strong impact of health status again, health status this time in the first two years of life on severing schooling outcomes. More specifically, better health leads to reductions in delayed enrollment, reduced grade repetition, and greater learning per year of schooling as measured by test scores. So healthier children had better test scores later in life. And then a much cited paper on Zimbabwe by Alderman, Hodinot, and Kinsey find that increased early child height is associated with more years of educational attainment. So this is typically an investigation using panel data where we infer the effect of a good health status at early age with outcomes of the same, uh, of the same pupils later in life by, by panel data. Then the second way of studying these things is by organizing policy interventions. We're going to deliberately change an element in the policy environment to see what the outcome is on outcomes later in life. And these studies are not new. Um, they've been already done in the 80s. Uh, this is typically done together with, with, with the medical profession where, for example, once one um, takes a, a cohort of, of children to a specific group we're going to administer something. For example, uh, we're going um, to supplement the diet with vitamins or with iron or with other kinds of, of very nutritious foods. And we're going to have a control group. And then a few years later, we're going to see if this intervention, this policy intervention, increased the schooling performance of the students who received these dietary supplements versus the control group. And typically, we find that this works. So there are some studies in the literature that really show that these kind of dietary supplements, this improved nutrition at young age, increase the school performance of children later, later on in their life. And Miguel and, and Kramer in 2004, they evaluate a randomized program in Kenyan schools of mass treatment for intestinal worms using inexpensive deworming drugs. Eh? So they administer deworming drugs to many schools and they also have a control group. And so the study was based on 75 primary schools. They found that the absenteeism in treatment schools was 25% lower than in comparison schools. And that deworming increased schooling by 0.14 years per pupil treated. So when I say this to students who, who may not know uh, what profession to choose, I say, well, you know, this is evidence that development economics works. Eh? That development economics can be very interesting to study. It's not a dull subject. You can actually improve the lives of young students by inexpensive treatment. And research has shown that these kind of inexpensive treatments actually work. After this research in Kenya, a group of students has built an NGO. An NGO actually distributing deworming pills to students because actually improved health increases schooling outcomes later in life. And this RCT of the randomized control trial is some of the strongest evidence that one can have to find these effects. Um, now we come at an, at an issue um, where my own contribution to this literature starts. And I came to this by seeing that economic shocks, which are most commonly studied by economists, of course, often have a gendered impact, meaning that the health of girls is primarily affected by price shocks or by climatic shocks or by nutrition shocks. Boys and men often seem to be shielded from the negative impact of these shocks. This is coming out of, of several papers and one can wonder why is this the case? Well, 
It turns out that in many countries, parents discriminate in favor of boys. When there is a, an economic shock, they try to shield boys more than girls, maybe for inheritance reasons, for security later in life, even if parents do not want to discriminate, in the face of scarce resources, they may discriminate in favor of boys. So the impact of these shocks is also worse for poor individuals, which is not a surprise. Poor individuals have difficulty smoothing uh, their household consumption against uh, economic shocks. <coughs> Whereas the non-poor often do not feel the impact of the shock, exactly because they have some capital, they have some social ties, they have a lot of resources to smoothen the impact of the shock. Now, the distributional impact of political shocks, which I think is important for this conference, is different than the one of economic shocks. That's, that's something that comes out of my research and the research that have, we have been doing in the Households in Conflict Network. The distributional outcome of conflict shocks is different from economic shocks. So there is this nascent literature that tells us that it can be the health and the education of boys from non-poor households that may be primarily affected by violent conflict. And in fact, it's counterintuitive counter because we usually think that it is the poor or girls from poor households that are primarily affected. But that seems to be more the case in, economic, in the face of economic shocks. When we talk about conflict, it could very well be that boys from wealthy households who in peacetime get a lot of educations, they are very badly affected by shocks because their school is destroyed, uh, because their road is destroyed, because there's insecurity. So it could be that they are the ones losing out a lot. And this counterintuitive result comes out of this research on the economic impact of, of conflict shocks. <coughs> and let me give you a few examples of, of how we can study this. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in, in Rwanda and Burundi the last couple of years. And I want to show you some of the shocks that impact this cycle. Okay? That's why we're interested in it. We're not interested in it just because we want to study shocks. No, we're interested in studying shocks exactly because we know that shocks occurring early in life have bad effects later in life. That's why we're interested in that. And so I'm going to study the, f the first two levels, so the, the health early in, in childhood and later on. Okay. So what we do in the Rwandan case, we're going to exploit uh, the fact that there was a crop failure occurring in the south at some point, typically in 1991, 1992. And there was also a civil war going on in the north. So we have a political conflict in the north, and we have an economic shock, namely a crop failure in the south. And so the non-affected region can be used as a control group. If I look at, at the map of Rwanda, this was before 1994. So a crop failure in the south, which has nothing to do with the civil war, and a civil war in the north, which has nothing to do with the crop failure. So this seems to be an ideal setting to test the effect of economic shocks versus the effect of conflict shocks on a group of people residing in a certain area, while at the same time we have a control group, namely the rest of Rwanda. So what economists call an empirical identification strategy exploits two sources of variation. Variation in when and where regions experience crop failure and civil war, and variation in birth cohorts measuring child's exposure to the shock. Of course, we want to measure what happened to the children who lived in those areas at the time of birth or just afterwards. Huh? And so what we do, we estimate province birth court fixed effect regressions on the children in that, in that birth court and we use UNICEF household level data for that. So we find that boys from poor and non-poor households as well as girls from non-poor households in the crop failure region did not exhibit stunting did not exhibit lower height for HF scores than the control group. So we didn't find any effect on this group of children. However, for girls of poor households, we do find an effect in the crop failure region. Their health was worse affected by the crop failure compared to the control group. Only girls from poor households. All children, however, in the civil war region were affected by the, by the civil war, be it boys or girls from poor as well as non-poor households. They had worse height for HZ scores. And so what I derive from that is that these kind of shocks, this crop failure shock versus the civil war shocks, have a different distributional impact according to wealth groups or according to the gender of the child. They do not have the same impact. Eh? 
economic shock, the crop failure shock impacted the girls of poor households only, whereas the conflict affected everybody, everybody. And you can imagine also why this is the case. If you see the rains are failing, or if you see that this season you're going to have a crop failure, parents have the time to react on that. Parents have the time to discriminate between children if necessary. In the face of civil war, that occurs suddenly, rebels attacking your village, parents do not have the time to discriminate. Even if you are wealthy, you're bound to be badly affected by the civil war because you're forcibly displaced, your field is destroyed, your cattle is stolen, your house is burned. Okay? And so what we do in these economics, these microeconomics of conflict, is to study exactly why different types of shocks have different types of distributional impact. Let me give another example of, of Burundi. We use the same approach. Yeah? So we are looking for external variation, a sudden shock, uh, to infer the impact of the shock on child health. And we are interested in it exactly because we know that later on in life, it will have a bad impact on the health of the children. Yeah? As in the case of Rwanda, we find that all children, boys as well as girls, from poor as well as non-poor households, born during the civil war, have felt the impact on their health. They are smaller than they should be compared to the control group. And if you go to Rwanda, you can actually see this. I'm not very tall, but when I go to the rural areas in Rwanda, I'm taller than everybody else. <laughs> and that, that's amazing, of course. Eh? That's amazing. In Holland, of course, I would be smaller than everybody else. But in Burundi, I'm taller than everybody else. Yeah? So going beyond the Rwanda study, we were able to re-interview children in Burundi in 2007 who were, not measure, who were measured in, in 1998. So we go back to the same households 10 years later. And so of the 283 children in the household panel, 21 did not survive till the second round of the survey. And this is not because they were directly killed by violence. No, I'm not looking at that. Children are rarely directly killed by violence, at least in the Burundi case. We're studying this effect because of undernutrition, because of forced displacement. We know for sure that they are not directly killed by violence. And we find that the, the, the diseased children in the period leading up to 2007 had worse height for age death scores, which is a measure of health capital, back in 1998 compared to the children who survived. So if you look at that on a graph, you see a distribution of the height for age death scores. The blue line are the children who survived. The red line are the children who did not survive 10 years later. So what you see, the red line is, on, is in fact um, more to the left. So on average, the diseased children 10 years later had worse, worse height for eight Z scores. So their average is about minus three and a half, minus four. Whereas for the, the children who survived, it's about minus two, minus two and a half. So the curve is in fact shift, shifted to the left telling us, in fact, that the height for age Z scores or the health status of the, of the children early in life predict their survival chances several years later. Okay, so as I said, the reasons are not enough food intake, forced displacement, the burning of crops on the farm, the loss of livestock, in general exposure to violent conflict or the exposure to vector-borne disease. We find that the children who died in that period were longer or more exposed to violent conflict in the period before 1998 in their area of residence compared to those that survived. And as I said, we exclude direct deaths. So what we do is to try to find the causality of this relationship between nutrition and the probability of mortality. And we find that before that, so during the period where they were undernourished, these children were exposed much more to violent conflict in their region of residence compared to other children. You can see that on a graph again. This is the exposure to civil war in number of years. And the children who died were on average much more exposed than the children who survived. And this is the density function. So the, the red line is the density for the children who died. On average, this is one and a half, two and a half years, whereas the children who survived is maybe 0 0.5 or one year. And then, econometrically, or with the tools of econometrics, we try to find a statistical relation between exposure to civil war on the one hand, undernutrition, and the chance of mortality, or the probability of mortality on the other hand. In this way, in this exercise, we only find this for boys. Which again, tells us something that exposure to conflict affects boys more than girls. Which again, maybe sound 
counterintuitive because we think that it's usually the vulnerable who are affected by conflict. But again, in the face of the, 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 um, the chance not to discriminate between children and, and of, of different uh, genders, boys can be badly affected by conflict compared to girls leading to undernutrition and leading to, to premature death. For girls, we only find the relationship between undernutrition and premature death. We were not able to find in the Burundi case uh, the relationship with exposure to, to violent conflict. That was not st statistically significant. A word of caution for the link with economic development, eh? because it's, it's clear, for, of course, that better health leads to more human capital during the life course. It accumulates, it gives you higher productivity, but it's usually something for yourself. Of course, it may happen with many people in society, but think of a, of a land-scarce country or a capital-scarce country, all of a sudden people get better health. What will happen is that, and I derived this from a recent paper by Asimoglu and Johnson, better health increases life expectancy, but this is not necessarily followed by declines in the birth rate, it could be that population size increases because people have better health, they live longer. It's not immediately followed by, by declines in the birth rate. There is usually a, a large gap eh, known as the demographic transition. That large gap may take decades to, to occur. In that period in between, population size increases because life expectancy increases and the birth rate stays stable. So GDP may increase, but GDP per capita may not. So it could be that because of this improved health, GDP per capita may not increase. This all depends on the elasticity of the supply of capital. Take the example of a, a land scarce country. Land is scarce, capital is scarce. All of a sudden people live longer, meaning more competition for land. land the supply of land is not elastic, so it's a fixed amount. So you not immediately will see the, the benefits for, for GDP per capita, exactly because population may rise. So that, there's a warning that the link with economic development is not straightforward. Economic development does not only depend on health, of course. It also depends on the supply of capital, of manufacturing, of technology. Yeah? So let me conclude by this, by saying that shocks affecting health in childhood have long-lasting consequences for socioeconomic outcomes later in life. That has now been demonstrated by many, many papers. Poor children, and in particular girls, are most affected by economic shocks. That is typically the work that development economists have brought to the literature, where they say that it are typically the vulnerable people who cannot smooth their consumption over the life cycle who are badly affected by economic shocks. On the other hand, we also have to look at conflict shocks or political shocks, which not necessarily have the same distributional outcome than the more commonly studied economic shocks. It could very well be, and there are some recent papers in the literature, that tell us that non-poor children, or boys in particular, may be most affected by conflict shocks, exactly because they are the ones benefiting from the situation during peacetime, and say they're losing out the most. Improved health has substantial payoffs at the individual level, but not automatically at the aggregate level. All right, thank you for your attention. I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions. Uh, the dean just uh, went out of the room. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you have any questions, please feel free. Exactly. Yeah.